Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks a lot for um, coming along to our session this morning. It looks like we've got the, uh, the top of the bill, so it's my job now to thank all, the, all of the warm-up acts over the last few days and close the conference with the, with the headline act here. No, seriously, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here this week. And for the Xerti project, this is a, a huge milestone. Um, we've just graduated the incubation process with the Imperio Foundation, so we're now um, a fully-fledged project. Um, and that sets up a whole load of new opportunities for, a, for the project to, to grow into this and further communities um, and to grow our communities of users and developers and contributors. Um, so we're really excited to be here and really excited about what this means for the project. Um, my name's Julian Tenney and I've led the project from its beginning about 10 years ago. <clears throat> and this morning what I'm going to do is just give you a little bit of um, history and a bit of background about the project and where we've come from. But I want to focus in on the three values that I think um, that, that really underline and underscore what this project is all about. So <clears throat> the project began in 2004 when I joined the University of Nottingham. Um, the story is told really well in the video that we showed yesterday at the lightning talk, so we're not going to show that again this morning. Um, ooh. Um, but the, the resource that we've got up on the screen here and what we'd really encourage you to do throughout the session this morning is to bring that up on whatever device you've got in front of you. This is a project made using our software, so we're, we're eating our own dog food, as it were. Um, and you, you can launch this tinyurl.com slash 30 overview. So please bring that up and, and, and um, as we're talking, then we'll guide you through some of it. But there's a, there's a lot of resource in there. There's far more than we've got time to talk about. Um, this morning. So in, in, in there is the story so far video. There's a ton of different examples. Um, there's the story of the project's history, about our values. There's a whole load of how and why, different use cases, um, and so on. So I'll just give you a very sort of quick history of the project, which began in 2004. Like I said, we were looking to move our development environment from Authorware, which was the team at the university we were using at the time, um, to something that was going to work much better on the internet. And what we wanted to do was to make something that was going to make it much faster for developers to put content together and allow us to reuse good solutions to, um, to problems. So in, in the old days, you remember that projects were generally sort of handcrafted. Each one was started from scratch, and developers spent time building custom buttons and a new interface. Um, and all of that effort was being duplicated with every project that was being built. So we wanted to think about how could we have a standard interface that we could use over and over again and avoid having to do all of that work um, <clears throat> time and again. And also problems like accessibility, really difficult problems for developers to grapple with. Accessibility is one of our core values. And <clears throat> in 2006, we started working with just TechDIS in the UK. And that relationship has continued until, well, just, just tech just don't exist anymore. Um, but we still have very strong relationships with all the people that are in there. And, and the first thank yous that I'd like to say this morning are to, the, to Sal and all of the tech this team that have given us such great support in the 10 years that we've been working together. This project has very strong credibility around accessibility. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And we started to build tools that were aimed at technical developers. And um, the tools were originally for people that wrote code. We said, these, are, these tools are very easy to use. You can make content very quickly with them if you write some code. And people heard the bit about very easy to use, and they didn't hear the bit about if you write code. And I, I remember one of the early workshops that we ran with um, a group of learning technologists. And we started off the session. We were going to do a demo of how to, how to use the software. And I said, and if you... If you right-click on the desktop and create yourself a new folder, then we'll, we'll make the project in there. And there was pandemonium in the room. And people were like, what has he done? He's a witch. And you know, it was like, <laughs> OK, I think I'm learning something about what non-technical users mean. <laughs> so we, we discovered that. We carried on using the tools because it gave us a way of getting content into the Flash platform um, and being able to deliver content online. That was happening pretty much for the first time around that sort of period, 2004, 2006. Previously, we di distributed all of our content using executable files on a LAN. Um, and what we learned very quickly, people came, we started to grow a community of developers at that point. And what, what we learned was that we really needed to find a way of making these tools accessible to people that didn't necessarily write code and just wanted to use simple tools to <coughs> put content together. 
Um, that's when I started working with Ron and we started working on a suite of templates that sat above that technical layer and allowed people to use simple forms to populate um, a, a suite of page-based templates so that content could be authored very easily. The, the application was still a Windows application, um, so people did need to install it, and they did need to jump over the, the hurdle a little bit of, of encountering a, an, an interface aimed at technical programmers, developers. But, um, and so in 2008, we began an initiative that we sort of tentatively called Web-Based Certi at that point, where we thought, well, what would be great would be to move all of these tools into the browser so that people could access it from a web server. They'd have no reason to install anything, and it would really remove the barriers um, to, to access the, the content. Um, and we would hide the technical layer altogether from, from the user, so they wouldn't need to see that stuff at all. But we like to say that we want simple things to be simple, but we want anything to be possible. So the tools have always been, it's always been important for us to provide tools that, for power users or developers, that they can do the stuff that those people want to do. It doesn't stop you um, adding in custom functionality and it, all, the, all the stuff that developers want to do. As a developer, I've tried working with some templated systems and found it very frustrating that it, they, they kind of locked me into these rigid set of templates that didn't allow me to deviate from the, the path of righteousness that had been set out for me by the tools. So that, that, that was always important. In, in, we, we launched those tools for the first time at the University of Nottingham in 2008, and we made them available for the first time under a open source license in 2009, I guess, when we, when we made the first release. And the traction that we've had is, is huge. From, from there on, the community of users really started to grow, and we started to see adoption in, in loads of institutions all over the world. Um, in 2011, um, the developer community really started to take off, and that was the first time that I met these guys, and, and we sat down um, and thought about where the, we were going to take the project in the future. And I remember at that first meeting, Tom said to me, and he said, you know what, one day you're going to need to find a foundation to take this to. I thought, yeah, well, you know, we'll worry about that at some point down the future. So this day has ar arrived now, and we are, as I say, very proud to have come through the incubation process and to be have become a top-level project with Apirio. So the three values that really underscore the work, or the, the, the oh, sorry, the, the, the project, are that ease of use for non-technical users. <coughs> Without any users, your software has no value whatsoever. It doesn't matter how good it is. Um, and so we want to make sure that th these tools are, are easy to use and teach to people um, that are going to put together content in faculties. I'll give you some example of how this has scaled content production. At the University of Nottingham, back in 2004 when this all started, we had a dedicated team of multimedia developers that were putting together maybe 20 or 30 projects a year, all hand-rolled and, and started from scratch. In the six years now, seven years I suppose now, since we launched 30 online toolkits at the University of Nottingham, we have now over 12,500 learning objects that have been created. So you can see that's a huge upscaling of, of, um, of, of content creation, and it's really empowered people to put stuff together on their own. We can teach people to use the software in about half an hour, um, and that's important. It's not a day-long training course where we can take people through a long and detailed plan and agenda to, to teach them how to use it. It's, we can teach the basics in half an hour, and often people go away and we never hear from them again until we see content that's actually finished and they've published. Where people want to come back, then it allows us to get into the advanced, um, some of the more advanced stuff, and to talk more about how to make really effective use of it. The tools are collaborative, so it sets up a really nice workflow for specialists in my team to collaborate with subject matter experts in faculty, where we can, we can bring to bear our graphic design skills, video production skills, programming skills for custom interactivity, and to work alongside people that are actually owning the projects from the subject matter expertise. They can add all of that, and we can plug in all the bits that we're working on to, to do that. So ease of use is a, is a, key, a, key, a key plank of the, of the Xerti project. Um, there are some tensions with that because it allows rich content to be developed, and so how do you make something that's easy to use that allows rich, rich and relatively complex things to be put together? So navigating those tensions is important to us. Accessibility is the next sort of big, big plank of what we're about. We, we want to have the best of breed accessibility. We, we want to make sure that people are using tools that they're very reassured that 
at the, in the runtime that we're doing as much as possible to provide resources that are truly and highly accessible. Accessibility is a difficult issue for people to get their heads around. There's a lot of work to do to try and understand all of the issues about accessibility. Um, and we set about um, making sure that we provided in the technology the best solutions that we could. And we take a holistic view to accessibility. Um, accessibility is much more than just ticking off items on a checklist. So I'll give you some examples of that. You, we would make content keyboard accessible, and there are lots of accessibility reasons, traditional accessibility reasons, I guess, to do that. But really, it's about making sure that your software works as well as possible for the greatest number of users in as many circumstances as possible. So it does allow people that have RSI and can't use a mouse to tab through the content and operate it like that. But it also allows the guy on the train who's forgotten his mouse to use the content. Um, and, and there are lots of other use, useful reasons why that's a good thing to do. In the early versions of the Flash content, we implemented our own screen reader software. Um, Internet Explorer has some technology that you can easily hook up to, and you can make your content speak. And we wanted to, we wanted to do that because we think that using a screen reader is useful to people that wouldn't normally consider themselves to be screen reader users. So for instance, screen readers you'd think of as being the, that technology is there to assist people who can't see, but actually dyslexic people can benefit hugely from listening to content um, and working through it like that. And there are probably other use cases where people find that useful, but it's got nothing to do with assistive technology. It's about making sure that the technology works in as many situations for as many people as possible. And so having high, high credibility and accessibility has been really important to us. And it's actually given us a lot of traction. So there's two benefits to that. But it's really it's about making sure that the software works as well as possible um, for as many people in as many situations as we can. And that's been a, an approach that's taken us a long way. And then the third sort of plank of what we're about is about nurturing and building a friendly and positive community of users and developers. Without that community, the software is worth nothing. And so we want to set up a community where we're encouraging people to come and join us. We're friendly and we're positive. We're not going to get into fights. We're not going to make you feel stupid. There are no stupid questions. And we are very responsive to the questions that we get through the forums, through the mailing lists, and so on. And what that has done has allowed people to feel comfortable contributing to that discussion. And we've been able to pick up on so much in the way of use cases and wouldn't it be great if ideas people come and said, you know, well, this doesn't work very well. And we've been able to respond very quickly to that and to fix it. And when people see that responsive support um, and see us taking on board the contributions that they're making through those discussions, then it really drives engagement with the software and people feel very comfortable will be because they know that that support is in place. So that's been the, the sort of the third thing. And so this is a really great opportunity for us now to, to sort of extend our community and to welcome in all the Aperio projects and communities and, and all, all of the other people that you touch. So that's all I'm going to say this morning. I'm going to hand over to Ron now. He's going to take you through some, some of the other examples in that resource. Um, um, and that's, yeah, that's me for the time being. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Thanks, Julian. Um, it would be good to show some more pages in this resource. As Julian mentioned, there's an awful lot we put in here, and it's our plan to keep this up to date as new developments. In fact, we have a roadmap page that um, when we use this um, resource at uh, the Paris Aperio ESUP conference, things were still yet to be included, they're all in there now before we released um, the beta for incubation. So this is almost already out of date, but we'll keep it up to date. My brief really um, in my contribution to this session is to convince you even further if you haven't already been convinced as to how and why you should care about Xerti. Um, the how bit, we, it, we obviously don't have time to talk about installation and all the technical requirements, but it's a very simple application. The code is available on GitHub and on our community site as a straightforward zip download. And basically, you install it on a web server that has PHP and MySQL. Um, many people run it on Windows servers with IIS or Apache or um, any other myriad of web servers, and basically, as long as you've got MySQL and PHP, it's a very straightforward um, installation to use. We have at the top of this page um, a link to um, 
a resource that we did with Just Technus in the UK that's a webinar all about installation and um, that side of things. And there's also a, a second link to a blog post um, that will give you details about where you can get support either with in-house installations or external hosting. So we're not going to cover that in detail during this talk, but suffice to say all of that's available and um, it's very easy to use. Um, there is a bit of an interactive simulation here that, that will explain as you, um, if you open that up and go over it, that will give you kind of tool tips as to what the different features are. It looks a bit old because that's the older interface and it's changed twice since that was built. So um, ignore the kind of slightly dated looking interface, but it, it's a good way of kind of quickly um, getting an overview of how the interface works. I wanted to quickly pick out the point that obviously Julian was making as well, that we used to have this phrase, if you can shop online, you can use Xerti Online Toolkits. And Julian's already talked about the, the history of this. When we were first delivering training for this, and we'd, we'd say to people, put up your hands if you bought something online in the last year, there might only be two, three, two or three people in the audience, because that's how long ago it was. Um, now I would imagine we all have, and the, the point there obviously is if you can fill in an online form, you can use the tool. So there really isn't a technical barrier to using it. The caveat to that is it means that some people create lots and lots of pages of text behind glass. And that really isn't what Xerti is about. It's about um, using all the interactivity, using all the affordances that are in there, and we'll, we'll cover some of those. Um, but if all you're going to do is put a whole load of text online, you might as well stick to the PDF documents or the Word documents that you've got. Just a very quick demo, this is just a recorded demo of the kind of way that you use an author with Xerti. Um, so hopefully it's going to play. Um, we have a number of project templates. So this one, click, click in here, is the, the main interactive template. You give it a name and you click create. You then get presented with some form fields. So giving your object an overall title, and you can see that being typed there. And we have an insert menu that then you select from something like 60 odd different page types in this particular template, and here we're adding a graphics and sound page. So again, we get prompted with a form, you enter the text for the title and the text for the body of the page, and then you browse to an image on your machine, and when you click submit, it uploads that image to the server. So it's offering online, and of course, because of that, it means it's very quick and easy to share that resource immediately. Um, and you can share it in a number of ways, both privately and publicly. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of talk through perhaps when we go grow through further. But just to, just to show you, once you've done that, you click play and you get the first page in your resource. And, and as I say, that's nothing particularly impressive. It's just a static page. But we have a whole category of media pages, navigator pages, and then a whole section dedicated to um, interactivity. Um, and if there are any Flash developers in the room, um, when they see how easy it is to create some of the interactions that they perhaps used to make their living for, me and Julian included, you see the real benefits of actually transferring that ownership of creating not just static content, but interactive content to all people that want to use it. And that includes all faculty, all, faculty, all staff, and potentially all learners. Um, just to pick up that point there, there really isn't any technical barrier so that means there's no excuses. And if you think about your liaison with whoever you support, that's actually quite, um, you know, that's quite a key point to make, that there, there really isn't that technical barrier, and therefore those barriers about kind of, I don't have time to learn this, I don't have time to use it, actually really do go away. And the point on that that I would say, even if you're not convinced from what you hear with us today, what I normally say during face-to-face -face training, at least give your learners the opportunity to use it and watch what they do. And we have lots of evidence, there's examples in here of projects in the UK where it's not only kind of informal projects that students are created, but are now in HE organisations being set up as formal assessed tasks where they're creating projects to demonstrate their understanding and they're using Xerti to, to do that. So labouring the point here, but it really is all friend for everybody, the specialists, teachers and learners. And as, as Julian said, the tool is incredibly powerful for specialists. So 
Um, there's no barrier there. You can extend it. It's open source. You can develop as much as you want. But then use your time for that and allow your faculty to just do the ordinary bits, like adding the images, adding the assessments, correcting any um, paragraphs of text, and so on. Um, we often hear specialists, and, and often learning technologists, I have to say, say a phrase like, well, I look to Xerti, but I prefer other tools. I prefer, perhaps they say, I prefer the lesson tool in Sakai, or I prefer Articulate Storyline, or Captivate, or any of those other tools. What I'd say is two things. One is, it's not either or. You can embed all of that content inside Xerti resources. And more importantly, it's not about what's best for you. It's what about's best for your faculty and your learners if you're trying to empower them to create content themselves. And that's really where we kind of have our main focus is empowering everybody in an, in an institution to, to offer. We also have this notion of all for once, use anywhere. So if you are viewing this resource on your um, mobile device, be it a full screen device or a tiny little handheld phone, you should find, and if I just resize this browser, for instance, you'll see the way that works. It's reflowing it. It's resizing the images because this particular template is based on the, the responsive Twitter bootstrap library. But of course, you don't need to know how any of that technically it's all there when you fill in the forms and publish your content. Um, Julian mentioned it's highly accessible. And we have a couple of examples that are actually embedded from the interface. So here's a screenshot, and you'll see that there's a, a little button to change, for instance, quickly change to a high contrast view um, or a, a shaded view. But also, once you open that up, there's links to a student guide for accessibility and a tutor guide for accessibility. So they're instantly available all the time throughout the interface. We don't really have time to go into that in detail, but you can explore that um, yourself. Um, another fantastic part of the tool is collaboration. So you can see the, the group of us here. We offered this resource in advance of the, the conference in Paris. We were based in different countries. We were using it at different times, and we collated this resource, and that's all built into the tool. Um, so you can see um, examples where, for instance, specialists or managers or teachers or teachers and learners can all act on the resource at the same time. And we're seeing examples now in the UK where teachers are creating a, almost a template on its own with a, with a guidance as to what the student is then to populate and then giving copies or sharing copies with the, stu the student. So it's, it's kind of, you know, it, there's kind of template template system within the, the templating functionality. As already mentioned, we have instant sharing. So as soon as you created a resource, which by default is private, as soon as you're ready to share it, you go into the properties panel and share it in a number of ways. And that gives you a public link that you can send via email. And it gives you an embed frame that you can um, embed in a blog or Sakai or anywhere else you wish. So it actually gives you the best of both worlds in terms of having structured content inside your VLE in your case, in, in many of your cases, Sakai, but also gives you that option to share it more publicly, perhaps with other institutions or um, you know, with collaborative projects that, that don't have access to your, your VLE. And that's a powerful kind of cross-curriculum sharing benefit too. Um, we have this notion of giving your projects. So you create a, a, a successful learning sequence with a mix of kind of information given and interactions and testing. Um, and once you've refined that, perhaps with feedback from your students, you can give whole copies to colleagues, to students, to other faculty areas to learn from what you've explored and refined, but also to use as a starting point for their own content. Here's, um, we have a, an interactive template, the main template that people use, in fact. And here's an example of, of a project created with that embedded in this kind of site or bootstrap template. So actually, um, you can use all of the templates together, and we have that kind of functionality. I'm not reading this, so this is going to be wrong. But you get the point. We have not just static content here. We can use all the interactivities to embed that in um, the bootstrap template as well. We have export and import. So we have SCORM import, two flavors. Um, and 
there's work going on. I know this has um, increased this week of kind of exploring the XAPI um, possibilities in the future. But we also have export for offline access. So you can create your content and put it on a USB stick or a CD drive and make that available where connectivity is an issue. And again, it's not either or. You can still have all that content embedded in your VLE, but it gives you the option to, to do all that as well. Um, in terms of the, the feature set to round all of that off, we have RSS feed. So any project you add, you can choose to make it part of a site-wide RSS feed or a personal RSS feed. And we have a syndication feed. So the potential there is every installation across the world can effectively talk and share with each other. And we have a separate site, which we don't have time to talk about here, but is LinkedIn, that you can submit your feed, your installation, to that to that site, and then all of that content is harvested. But again, it's optional, it's per project, um, so your individual faculty members can choose which projects that they wish to share in that way and which, which they don't. We have academic communities, active academic communities, as well as technical communities. Julian already mentioned that it's a very friendly um, and mature community. Um, and so, although we're new to Aperio, we're certainly well established in that respect for a long time. Of course, with all of the projects you'll have seen this week, there's, there's lots more to come. Um, I just wanted to round off that if you still don't care what I've kind of covered here, and it, and it has been a whistle-stop tour, on the workshops that we did on Sunday, um, we had a couple of people that had never used ERTI before, um, and quickly created learning objects and embedded them into their Sakai lesson modules, I believe. Um, the details are in there. You can contact those people, I'm sure, if you know them. Um, and linking all of this back to the keynote at the beginning of the week by David Wiley, that notion of retain, reuse, revise, remix, redistribute, you'll have heard briefly from what I've just kind of covered that we have all of that and we've had all of that for a long time. And there's very few tools that allow proper, true repurposing of content. As I say, if you, can, if you allow an export link or a download, people can import that content that you've created into their own Xerti installation and start either using it as it is, remixing it, redistributing it, and obviously we encourage all of that. And there was a strap line that we, we heard, first of all, David mentioned about student as makers. Um, and the idea that, um, or the notion we've come up with that um, Xerti also does facilitate the unexpected. Um, under the examples tag, tab here, you'll see a kind of bit of a history of development and examples, and that blue interface that I'm scrolling past there is the older Flash interface. And then some newer HTML5 versions, and you can read about all of these and explore them. There's the links there to those specific examples covering lots of different curriculum areas. Um, and we have a couple of um, technical demonstrators. But where the really exciting, particularly in the UK, but I'm, I'm sure you can identify with this, there's some examples here from the Higher Education Academy in the UK where they had projects which were about digital literacies in the curriculum. But actually, for many of those projects, Xerti was the perfect tool. And you'll find some excellent examples and case studies um, from those projects. We're, it's a truly international tool. So we have examples from around the world. You can, you can see an example of that there. And right at the bottom of the examples page, you'll see um, some links to some further collections. So if you use tools like Scoop It or Pinterest or Delicious, um, you'll find whole collections of case studies and examples that you can explore. Um, I think I'm going to hand over to um, Inga to, to talk about the community because that's another important part of our development. Well, thank you, Ron. Normally, they left me for uh, one minute or so uh, because they are talking and talking and talking, but now I have 50 minutes, <laughs> so <laughs> we have some time for questions later. Um, my name is Inge Donkervoort, and I'm one of the non-technical Zurte users and uh, uh, a member of the community, and I always ask the most annoying questions to the developers uh, about why doesn't this work or why can't I have a button there? 
Um, but they always help me very, very uh, nicely and quickly. And um, we use um, a certain community website. I will show you the front page of it. It's here. On our community uh, uh, website, you find uh, also a lot of showcases and examples of projects others made. Uh, there is a forum, and uh, like Julian said, we are really a friendly community, so if you ask a question, you get a um, uh, uh, quickly response, and in a nice way. Uh, if you want to help out, you can uh, put your answers also in there. Uh, what you can find there also is the downloads and the resources. So if you want to download the new uh, X30 tree, the, it's the beta version. You can find it there, but also some resources of how it works and what you can do with it. Um, you can find resources on the community website, but you can also join us on GitHub or uh, we have two mailing lists. That's a mailing list for teachers and a mailing list for um, uh, uh, developers. So if you want to join us and help us, please let us know and we can help you to find your way in Xerti. Ron was talking about the roadmap. This, this was the roadmap we had for the Aperio um, meeting in Paris last uh, winter. And almost everything that's in here is already in the new version. Uh, we are working on some other things like LTI and XAPI and that kind of things. That takes a little longer to uh, accomplish, but that's also all in progress at the moment. What I want to show you is two new uh, templates we created. Um, it's the media lesson template. I don't know if I can show it. Can we go? Yes, it's better. The median lesson template uh, is a really nice feature where you can have a video in one of the windows and that's synchronized with your, uh, uh, for example, your slideshow or with questions. In this case, you see an example of the UK rainfall, and I think that's a lot, rain in the UK. <laughs> but when I start the video, and we are in January at the moment, then the, uh, the map and the buttons below are synchronized with the video. When I go to, for example, the end of the video, in this case, you will see that the map uh, will change into it's taken a while to November, and the map is also changing. I can also use the buttons in down here, and then I go to the map and of December. Um, in this case, we used it this way, but you can imagine that you can have a lecture from uh, one of the teachers and connected this to his slides and also added um, interactivities from uh, Xerti in another panel. And then uh, all of a sudden they get a question. They have to answer it before the video plays on. So you can use it in a whole of, lot of different ways um, to let them engage with the materials in the video. Another new template we uh, have in it now is the decision tree. In this case, uh, the example is about an env environmental guide. Um, in the decision tree, you can ask questions and um, regarding the, the, the answer they choose, you go to a different page. Mm -hmm. So in this case, is the problem uh, gaseous emission? I don't even know what it is, but I will click yes. <laughs> Where's my button? I click yes. I go to next. No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. 
And in the end, I have the results, and I can show my students where they can go to give them some links or documents, and um, uh, also can have an overview what, with the answers, and I can send it by email or print it. These are the two latest um, uh, newest page types we have, and as Ron said, we have 60 of them. Uh, so just try it out and explore them. Uh, all kind of inter interactivities, um, navigation. Also, you can have some connector pages that you can have a nonlinear uh, module, so you can differentiate for your students. Just try it out. I think this was what I should say, <laughs> and I used. How many time? We have some time for questions. I don't know if there are any questions. So you mentioned the number of, of learning objects that have been created. It's a really impressively large number. What kind of challenges have you had? What kind of work have you had to do around maintaining that big a library? Yeah, we did look at that. Um, we've, of that 12,500, it is a big number. Um, around about 2,000 are finished, reasonably well polished and thought out pieces of content. Um, yep, there's a lot of hello world and testing, testing and, and that sort of stuff. But 2,000 is still a big number. And in, in, in seven years, that still represents a big upscaling of um, the content production compared to the, the, old, the old fashioned ways, if you like. Yeah. I think it's probably we would assume people are working on their own thing, yeah. Um, there, are, there are some really big initiatives, so in the Language Centre they have a big collaborative effort and, and in that one department they've created over 700 learning objects. It really suits you know, modern language learning where you want to be able to show video or play sounds and then have the, have the learner respond to that, that sort of stimulus, yeah. yeah. Um, the, other, the other challenges are around quality, so to begin with then the idea that you would just let the faculty run away with these tools and create what they want was sort of horrifying to some people because, my God, what are they going to create? <laughs> um, you have to trust them to do that. Um, and, and what this does is, is it takes away the, the, the complexities of authoring and it really exposes the, the problems and challenges around good instructional design and effective learning pathways, I guess. And it allows us to focus much more on that rather than technical issues which are, are a sideshow for, for faculty that want to put stuff together. Yeah. One of the things we didn't show was in the community page there's a whole load of um, quotes from um, existing users. There's a list of organisations but you can see the kind of superlatives that they sometimes <laughs> use. Um, maybe a bit of exaggeration but you'll get the point there and there's lots of evidence even within that, that subset of our, our kind of feedback about how powerful it is for learners to use to, to create content. Aren't really any, it, it, yeah, are there, what challenges are there in getting results into a gradebook um, when you're using this content through SCORM um, to, to, to track data? We, the difficulty for, for us as the tools designers is understanding what data people might want to track and how they want to track it. So you can, you can tra track a lot with the uh, SCORM packages from uh, 30, but it depends on the um, LMS, uh, what you can get back. So um, you have to look at your LMS. What, what data can it retract from the SCORM packages? Yeah. For, pe for people here, I, I expect it wouldn't be difficult for you to add code that would allow you to start tracking data in, in custom ways into the LMS. We, by default, track a quiz score, um, and, and, a, and a quiz score gets tracked. But that's because it's not because we can't do more than that. It's we don't know what strategy that you guys want to follow for tracking. Do you want to track every interaction? Do you want to track every you know, page visit is what, what's meaningful and useful for you. So. Yeah, 
No, we don't track anything onto the server. Um, we, we track usage, actually, so you can see that um, your pages are getting hit and you get some idea that people are actually finding it useful. Um, but we're not tracking much more than that. And we have some installations that uh, track results. Um, uh, Moodle, I don't know if I'm cursing now, <laughs> is, a, is a, a, a platform that does that really well. But there are others that also uh, uh, yeah, if you're showing launching. a lot of results. I don't know how it is in Sakai, uh, because we didn't have uh, tested that. So I w will invite you to please create a SCORM package and try it and let us know what it, uh, what it can do. The other thing we're saying is that, again, someone at our workshops on Sunday that had never used Erty before, as well as the, the people that had embedded what they created in Sakai, I think at least one person created some activities in Sakai and embedded it into Xerti. We have a, an embed content page, which means that effectively you can embed anything as long as it's online within a Xerti piece. And that offers all sorts of affordances in terms of you know, bringing in that combination of which tools work best. So an assessment that sits in Sakai, you could easily potentially surface inside a Xerti piece to have much richer tracking than something that's exported as SCORM and, and effectively divorced from the installation. And to a certain extent, provides a barrier to keeping that up to date and improving the quality of the resource. Because if you've got this export and import metaphor, it's kind of a, a barrier to that kind of regular improvement. Um, but as we said, I think there's been discussions already, and um, it, it you know, hopefully won't be too long before we have kind of XAPI where you get the best of both worlds and you can keep your Xerti resources in the Xerti install. And so the end user, they just see the content and interact with it, and those, those grades are stored in the, in the record store and so on. Just before we wrap up, actually, um, we can come back to some questions if there's a few more, if we still have time. But I just wanted to do a few thank yous. I really wanted to thank Ian and everybody at Apirio that have supported us through the incubation process. It's really been appreciated and, and, and the support that Ian's been able to provide has really helped us attend here um, and, and move, move the project very quickly through that process. So Ian, thanks very much indeed. Um, it's also a good time just to thank everybody at the University of Nottingham that supported um, the project and contributed to it over the years. So all the people, I'm not going to try and name everybody, that have developed it or sponsored it or supported it or promoted it or trained users in it and all that good stuff, it's a terrific effort. So thanks very much for that. And that, and that goes for all of the, the community people out there that have made contributions as users, as developers um, uh, in, in, in the world. So you know, thanks very much to, to everybody that's taken, taken the time to help us get the project to this milestone. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>